Okay, if everybody could just mute themselves. Good evening, I'm Sylvia Vogelman and I'm glad you could join us this evening. As part of the Occupy the Zoom 2021, we're highlighting the issue of food insecurity. There will be a viewing of This is Hunger, a digital experience produced by Mazon. Mazon, which means food in Hebrew, was the first national organization to rally the American Jewish community around the issue of hunger and remains the only national Jewish organization dedicated exclusively to the same cause. They have created materials which we are going to use tonight to highlight the issues around food insecurity. We've invited Greg Silverman, the executive director and chef of Westside Campaign Against Hunger to speak about the state of food insecurity in New York and two BJ members, Beth Siegel, who's the coordinator of the BJ lunch program and Ira Wolfman for the wise guys. If you have any questions or comments during the program, please put them in the chat and we will try to answer them. Every year before Yom Kippur, there has been an appeal by the rabbis for congregants to bring a check to services in support of West, West Side Campaign Against Hunger. At the end of Yom Kippur services, they have encouraged us to contribute to Mazon even before we eat. The United States Department of Agriculture defines food insecurity as a lack of access at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. During COVID, this problem was evident in the long lines of cars and people who needed assistance in obtaining food. We have a short hunger quiz that we hope you will participate in. No grades given, I promise, and nobody will see your answers, so don't be afraid to join in. Uh, Kiana is gonna upload the quiz and as you go along, you can answer it, and then I'll be telling you what the correct answers are. Okay, so please join in. There we go. Okay, so folks should see the poll up on their screen, right? Yep. Great. We have about 30 seconds to answer. Okay, everyone answered. So let's see, and I will share the results of the poll. Okay. Okay, well, 50% of you got this right. Uh, the total population of the US is 326 million. 40 million represents about 12 to 13% of our total population. That is more than the entire population of Canada. There is hunger in every congressional district in the country. Okay, the next question. How many people of those, how many of those people are children? Having fun yet? <laughs> Here are the results. Um, doing pretty well there. Um, the answer is 12 million. Um, hunger is hunger is disproportionately affects children. The percentage of children in the hungry population is larger than the percentage of children in the population as a whole. So that's really you know devastating to think about that. 12 million children. The next question. What is the most common way Americans receive food assistance?
That's right. Government programs, 47, 57% of you had that right. Um, food assistance programs include the National School Lunch Program and SNAP, which was formerly the um, uh, food stamp program. Okay, we have one more. Two more. Oh, two more. What percentage of food assistance in this country is met by government programs? Well, we can't show a whole pie chart, but imagine a whole pie chart. So the correct answer is 95%. Um, most people are very unfamiliar with the massive scale of government programs and the inability for charitable programs to fill the gap in those government programs if those government programs are ever eroded. No. Um, it's important to know these facts and figures because when you're educated, you can educate others, including voters and elected officials. When you're informed, you can be part of the changing system. When we looked at this um, uh, quiz, um, I was really amazed at the answers, um, some of which I had no idea. Um, we're now going to, as part of also the This is Hunger, the Mazon piece, um, we're now going to share a, a digital experience called This is Hunger. So you will virtually meet the real people struggling with hunger. The people in this piece share their stories with their own voices and words. So Kiana's going to upload that. Great. Um, I'm going to just mute all again to be sure. And I'm going to be sharing my screen okay um can i get some nods if people can see the screen okay and you'll abby's gonna text me if there's any technical issues hopefully not I was one of these people that thought you know, I'd, I'd work my 30 years and retire and live happily ever after. People don't realize, you know, what you got until it's gone. My life now as a senior citizen is probably harder than any of our other lives with the working, the raising of children. We're pretty much isolated here. My mom's been working 20 something years in the school system. She had the job, everything was fine. When I was in my 40s and 50s, I had no idea that this would happen. I thought when I 
turned 65, I would be living a good life. I always thought I could have a job and be able to progress in my job to be able to provide for my family. And I could list the different skill sets that I had in the military, but a lot of those skill sets don't translate into civilian life. My childhood was a very beautiful childhood. My mom was used to always getting us what we wanted. It wasn't the best, best house ever, but it still was ours. You know how they can be hungry in America? Because they've lost their jobs. They've depleted their retirement savings that they've had. They've lost their homes. For all my life, since I was 17 years old, I've served my country, been responsible, reliable, dependable, accountable. I went to work every day, did what I was supposed to do. Now I'm faced here, worried about feeding my family, and we shouldn't have to do that. Makes me feel sometimes like a, like a, like a garbage can out there just waiting to be picked up and dumped. It really does. All this stress, all this pressure. I'm a nerd. I collect toys. I've always been a kid at heart. I fell in love with working with kids and helping kids. I wanted to become a teacher, but it's a small royal town. It's actually falling apart. People aren't moving in. They're moving out. The community is getting smaller and smaller. And a lot of my problem is I'm such a family person that I don't want to move away from my mother and my dad. I feel like I'm not fixing meals that are nourishing. It is not a thing to do, I know. But if you have to have your meds to keep you alive, you're going to pay for them and try to do the best you can with what food you can get. Makes a person feel depressed. The senior meals are a blessing. You know, I like to eat. I'm like anybody else, but we're not generally able to afford healthy foods that some people can. When you go and you're used to having food to eat and then there's nothing there, it's just... We've got canned food in there that's probably older than me that we've had to open up and eat. Going to bed hungry gives you that feeling that you, you got to get up and eat. You, you, it keeps you from sleeping, really. It does. It's not a good feeling at all. My mother has nights when she can't sleep either. Just of the thought that she doesn't have a job and she thinks she can't provide and she can't live with herself. Not something anybody would want to go through. In 1957, at the age of nine, we moved the first time from one plantation to another. When I was a child, we had more, more food, more meats than I have now. I changed the way I eat because I don't have the money to buy what I used to buy. Now, not being able to feed myself the way I would like to, I cook to fill me up, not so much as healthy. I always try to eat healthy. 
and I'm on cholesterol medicines now. We have a two bedroom house in the country club garden. Thank you, but with the payments, my mom, she bought us one instead of paying the mortgage. It was very hard at first, like, uh, I don't want to take care of my sisters, but my mom's getting sick and I couldn't work. She got stamps, but with three kids, it doesn't last the whole month. Kids eat a lot. We're like, okay, don't eat as much. We have to make the food last. Don't ever think this can't happen to you or your family. I mean, I had a great UAW job making $100,000 a year almost with overtime. It's gone. It's gone. And all the other things that were attached to it are gone. Health care, life insurance. And now I'm stuck here trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I used to help people out with delivering food assistance. I'd never lived above my means. We used to go out to dinner a lot, you know, as a family. My wife cooks meals now that'll probably uh, last a few days longer. I mean, uh, never thought I'd be like that. It's a scary world we live in today. It really is. Hey, Jesus. I never really had to rely on the system to support me that much because I always felt that was wrong. I feel that there's people more deserving of that than me. I decided to apply for food stamps because of my family. I have a wife and a son, and I'm not able with my job to support them. I don't want to have to be doing the food stamp program, but it's for those families that aren't able to make it on their income. We were skipping meals so we could feed our baby. I have high blood pressure, and you have to be careful for that. But salads and fresh vegetables, we just don't consume unless they are out of a can. I bought a little carton of tomatoes out here to the store not long ago, which was two eighty nine dollars for just a few tomatoes in one of them little plastic things, cut them very small, and used very few at a time, just like almost enough to give you a taste. You don't have an understanding to you there, but you know what, what happened to me? can happen to anybody. It seemed like to me, once you get a certain age, you tossed aside. I never would have thought America would be like this. It affects your parents. It affects how you act. It affects how you work at school. It makes you feel like you're not normal. It really does. It's, it's not they should have to live with in our life. And there are kids right now, younger than me, having to go through it. Whoever can help with these programs, please do so. Because there's a whole bunch out there, a whole lot of people out there that I'm sure are hungry. You ever heard people talk about they're standing in line in the grocery line and somebody pulls out the, the bridge card and they've got a fur coat on? You ever heard things like that? I always thought I was, you know, living a pretty fair life. Six. That comes out to about 90 cents per person per meal. It's less than $18 a day. What to feed a family. And even apply for federal uh, assistance. It's not your finest moment when you ever make a little bit of here you have people that have lived their whole lives working in, in, in the United States of America that, that have no food. No, demand an accounting. Demand that people be held accountable for their actions. 
kind of wish I, you know, I could scrape up some type of food to get um, a decent meal. Um, if I had to add anything to this, it would be to um, get off of government assistance. You'll never ever be able to control what happens to you. You can think about it all day long, get planned for it. The only part you can control is how you react. So get involved, whether it be standing up for what you believe in, uh, demonstrating, advocating, bringing awareness, food pantries, food assistance, health care, whatever the case may be. Do something. From going to a very comfortable life to a struggling life, it made me think there's lots of injustice in the world. Change starts by one person. So I want to be that change in the world. Welcome back, everyone. That was quite a moving piece. Um, would anybody like to share what they thought about the video as you were watching and afterwards? Um, you can just unmute and, and start to speak. Don't be shy, please. Um, I can, yeah, I, I just wanna say that the numbers are so staggering that they're, yeah, it's hard to contemplate. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? It made me want to uh, <clears throat> uh, be more active in, in, actually I was thinking lost it <laughs> with the West Side campaign against hunger. And also I think I'm writing a check tonight Thank you, Carol. I'm sure Greg will be happy to hear that as well. Anybody else? Well, um, I hope that the quiz and the digital vi video were helpful in calling attention to the problem of food insecurity in America. I mean, it, it is just a, an enormous problem and um, it just keeps getting worse. Um, as the pandemic continues. Um, now we want to highlight uh, those who are doing work here in the community. If you have any questions, again, please put them in the chat. Um, we will answer them after the, after the discussion. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Greg Silverman, who's the execu executive director of the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Um, uh, he is a dynamic chef, restaurateur, and longtime leader in the anti-hunger movement. A West Side Campaign Against Hunger, uh, also known as WISCA, is one of the largest and most successful food pantries in New York City. It is the forefront of alleviating hunger by ensuring all New Yorkers have access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and supportive services. Chef Greg has worked in the food and hunger space for over 20 years. He previously served as the National Director of Program Partnerships to Share Our Strength and its No Kid Hungry campaign where he led the national growth of the Cooking Matters Nutrition Education Platform across all 50 states. Greg has also worked in London as a nutrition education specialist for the city government, a food consultant for public sector organizations, and is a successful chef and owner of multiple restaur restaurants in Ithaca, New York for over a dozen years. He spent time as a US Peace Corps volunteer in Mali. He has Greg has an MS in food and nutrition policy from the City University of London. He loves spending time 
walking, waking, his waking hours, um, cycling the streets of New York City, cooking food with family and friends, volunteering as a board member of Farm America and hashtag give healthy and cooking up change for the communities across the globe. Um, I'd like to welcome Greg and um, give you the floor now. Th thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Can you hear me all right? So great. Uh, so firstly, I just wanna, you know, I, I must as always, when I have these sort of opportunities, thank my entire staff. I uh, whisk a staff of 28 for all their efforts. They've, you know, during the, especially during the pandemic, never giving up, never backing down, always helping each other out amidst everything that's gone on and really bringing light to as many people as they can across the New York City hungry community. Uh, also to our board and advisory board and to everyone on this call and all the supporters who have, you know, given us the support of through their time, through their dollars, through their advocacy so that we can actually engage more and more people uh, than we've ever engaged before. So uh, I thought that the, between the quiz and the, and the video was a great stage setting. And I, hopefully I'll give a bit of sort of background slash what we've been up to at WISCA, because I think it's a good example of what's happening across the country for more innovative uh, emergency food fighters uh, like ourselves, and, and how we're trying to, you know, alleviate food insecurity uh, and how we're trying to change the system at the same time. So, uh, you know, this year, our team will distribute over 4 million pounds of healthy food. Uh, about 50% of that will be in fresh produce, over 2 million pounds of fresh produce. Two years ago, we didn't even distribute 2 million pounds of food, and now we're distributing more than that just in fresh produce. Uh, you know, many of you are familiar with our 86th Street Pantry, where Whisk has been for 42 years. But, you know, this year alone, we had four dozen other locations across all five boroughs. Uh, so we've gone from serving 27,000 households, or we're serving 27,000 households, uh, which we used to serve 27,000 customers. And so this year we'll probably serve, I think it's about 75,000 customers in general. Uh, you know, so we're known as the originator of the Choice Model Food Pantry, right? A free grocery store for those who have not been there before. Uh, a model where people, you know, as we think about making sure people have access to food with dignity, that you choose the foods you want. You know, we're not, we're not making choices for other people. That's that's the idea. And that is sadly an innovation when it comes to emergency feeding, where we've often believed like through can drives and such, you know, let me take whatever's at the back of my cupboard and and hungry people will will be happy for for my dented can of cream of mushroom soup or wh whatever unhealthy food that we decide to get rid of our get rid of. And so we we move along past that. And we're really focused on these three words, right? Dignity, community, and choice. And to be able to feed your family in a way you want to feed them, culturally appropriate food, healthy food. Uh, we're a community, right? A network. Many of you are volunteers. Some of you may be customers as well. Uh, some are, you know, we have site partners, we have donors who work together to feed this community. And the choice is about what foods people get, but also how they get the food, when they get the food, where they get the food, and what wraparound services, right? Like we have a whole team of eight staff who are just working on signing people up for SNAP, housing supports, you know, right now there's eviction prevention supports, uh, health insurance, anything we can to give people the wraparound services that as the quiz showed, those government supports are the lion's share of how we feed folks in need across the country. Uh, you know, for us, it's funny when, we, you know, as a chef, all I wanna do is make sure people have a great meal around a table. Uh, and that seems simple in some ways, like let's just have food for people at their table. But what it actually means is you got a roof over your head, you got food in your fridge, you have money to pay that electrical bill for that fridge and the house. It means you, you're healthy and you have the health care to support your family. It means you have a job to pay for the food. It means you're probably have some decreased level of stress, hopefully, so that you actually can relax and have a meal with your family uh, because you're not hopefully overworked or underpaid or fearful of eviction. And so, you know, on one level, you start to say, oh, just sit around a table and have a meal. That seems simple, but it is really complex. And that's really what we try to work on it at, at Wiska. So, you know, Wiska has been around for 42 years and many of you are longtime supporters. I know that. And, you know, I've only been here four and a half years uh, and I'm proud to be a part of the legacy and the continuation of change making that Wiska 
uh, is all about. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm going to speak a bit to, you know, the pandemic, right, and, and what that's done to hunger in New York, and we're an example of that, right? Like, one thing it's done is it's sort of forced us to separate organizational myth from mission, right? So, you know, and, and what we, you know, we've been day in and day out on the front lines with our community, and that's important, right? Like, that's key. That's, that's our mission, giving access to healthy food and supportive services. You know, what else, what else anyone else believes about the organization, we actually were able to pause a lot of different, had to pause a lot of programming to focus in on the mission. Uh, so it's been, you know, quite the year and a half, right? If, if you look back for us, March 13th, 2020, uh, you know, pandemic and all, but really what, what happened for us was uh, there was a scare in the building that someone, which seems silly now, but uh, a, a staff member of in the building, not with our organization, was in contact with someone else who may have had COVID and therefore we shut the entire building down and hired a cleaning service to do this huge deep clean uh, for a building the size of St. Paul, St. Andrews. You can imagine what that that costs if you were going to like do a deep clean for all of B'nai Jeshurun. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. And, and uh, it's an old building that at St. Paul's and St. Andrews. So, you know, 20 people came in to clean out this space. And within three hours, we moved 30,000 pounds of food up onto the street, rented a 30 foot truck to put it in, grabbed every laptop, everything that we thought we might need for the coming couple of weeks where this pen, this issue was ahead of us. And, and we haven't got, and we haven't served food inside since we've been out on the street and many have seen our tents outside, uh, since March of 2020. Uh, it's funny because I think back as a restaurant owner and chef who worked the line every night, you know, I thought the craziness of my restaurant years, uh, the crazy Friday nights and Saturday nights were, were behind me, but you know, a hold because in, in at Wisco, we were, you know, we had planned out our year. We had finished a five-year strategic plan. We were ready to go and just continue to move forward doing our consistent growth. Because the truth of the matter is, pre-pandemic, hunger was already at extreme levels and was already continuing to grow. And our customers were in pain. And so we were trying to figure out how we could really grow our work across the city to do what we needed to do to support the city. Uh, but obviously, uh, the pandemic had some other plans, but luckily because we had such big plans in place, everything just fast forwarded. Our five-year plan is pretty much complete in two years, right? We, we, we built out uh, a collective purchase model called the round table where we, and this is a testament to the, the legacy of Whiskas, we collaborate with some of the largest emergency food providers in the city, like Met Council, Holy Apostle, Soup Kitchen, New York Common Pantry, uh, and we share all of our data and we purchase food together, right? Competitors in emergency feeding aren't competitors, right? We talk every week. We, we, we shared during the pandemic, uh, we, we were ordering masks by the boat, you know, from, the, from boats flying, coming over on a boat from China. We were ordering, uh, building out our, stand, our operating procedures for outside delivery, making sure we were all on the same page, not wasting time building out the same plans, right? We are all one team trying to fight hunger in New York. And, and that might seem like, oh, of course it's like that, but the truth of the matter is that's, that's not how it works, right? How it works is organizations are focused on their own work and we feel that that's wrong and we've been trying to break that system. Uh, and that's why we work together in that way. Uh, and it's, it's been a bright spot, I'd say. And we, we do have bright spots during the pandemic. I mean, when the state of New York wasn't going to allow vaccines for emergency food workers, the final call with the leadership at the state was with myself and the head of New York Common Pantry and the lead on the vaccines for the state finally relenting, not just for WISCA, not for New York Common Pantry, but for 11,000 emergency food pantry workers across New York State. Like that's our job, right, is to represent all of our work together. Uh, so it just, you know, since mid-March, Obviously, it's been a wild ride in, in really strange ways. If you've been to Whiskey, you know we have an in-person grocery store. It's on the street. It's been on the street. Our social services customers come in and have intake interviews, and they meet with our team. 
that's been virtual ever since. And it's actually been incredible by doing intake interviews virtually and signing people up for benefits virtually. What has that done? That's allowed customers to not have to come back again and again with new documents, right? This is saving people time. And when we go back to our thoughts of dignity in our work, what we realize is we were kind of had blinders on for a long time. We believe that, you know, Dignity is giving people a choice between kale and collards, right? Or soy milk and, and whole milk. But it's also giving people an opportunity to get food and services how they want it. You know, when February or March hit at COVID, it was 700 seniors didn't show up for their food that month. And so we called every single senior and said, do you want food delivered? And we've never done that before. And we delivered to each and every one. And we've been delivering to to hundreds of people ever since. And that we realized was something really important, right? Customers want a choice and not just a choice of veggie, which veggies, although we will always have the best selection of veggies, proteins, variety of dairies compared to any pantry, I would assume on the planet, I'm fully confident to say that no one does what we do uh, across the entire globe. Uh, and that's a good and a bad thing, right? It's, it's sad that we, we, we can credit ourselves with that because New York has the most pantries of any city on the planet. Uh, but we continue to make adjustments, right? Our social services virtually, we suspended our culinary pathways program, our job training program, and we don't plan on bringing it back for a long time, if, if ever. It's, it was a small program, much beloved by everyone at WISCA, but not our strongest program and not core to the mission. Our clothing closet, we shut down and it will not come back as well. We realize in our dignity model that we've been handing out used, often ripped, broken, dirty clothing for decades that people wanted to cast off to us. And so we are like, we're not doing that anymore. And it, it actually isn't part of providing access to healthy food and supportive services to our customers. We have, we have better ways to support them. But these are huge decisions we had to make. Uh, we also had to make sure we took care of our team, right? We gave pandemic pay on for frontline workers. I will say in the last year, every single staff member received 12 weeks paid bonus in the last year. On top of that, uh, on top of paying out for uh, vacations that they couldn't take, we, we raised a lot of money this year, but we also made sure our team was supported right, in every way because they're the ones who have been doing this work in an incredible way. Uh, you know, we know, and we were fearful, like many people, and, and I've right, been in, in this job four and a half years, but for longstanding members of the anti-hunger community, they look back to things like 9-11, the 2008 financial crisis, Hurricane Sandy, and they're like, okay, that there'll be this huge influx of support, and there'll be this huge need, and then it goes away. The, the need dries up, or so we think, and... Uh, the support dries up as well. And, and so, you know, we've been very scared about that sort of fundraising cliff, as you'd say. And so we've been pushing really hard to continue the support because what we know is that even, even without Delta variant, the pain of the pandemic is worse in the next three to five years because our, our community of customers, you know, say we're almost 28% seniors, 25% youth, roughly 50% uh, sort of working age. You know, the older working age and seniors, they're not getting back in the workforce, right? Like there's not about workforce development. And if they're undocumented, they're not going to get put on SNAP and we'll see how much long-term support comes from even the state going forward to folks uh, who are undocumented. We hope there's more, but so we're going to be in this for the long haul and people are going to need more supports. Uh, so we continue to be fearful and to be pushing hard. So if you notice that if you're on our mailing list that we seem to be pushing harder when other people are saying, but the pandemic's almost over, right? We're like, no, it's not. And it's not gonna be for a long time. Uh, I mean, we've seen 15,000 new households come to see, get support from us. We've doubled the number of people who are getting food stamps from us. Uh, we had a woman who came to us who literally, you know, as we see like, she has three kids and a husband got laid off from her job, was staying at home because her spouse was an essential personnel at, at a hospital. And we helped to get them on unemployment. We helped increase their SNAP. 
We helped them get from a one bedroom to a two bedroom apartment. We instigated, you know, that paperwork. And, and those are the real benefits. Like we can, people show up because they want food, but like the quiz said, right? Like the big benefits are what come through the government. And so we, we can't ever think that like handing out the food, you know, to me as a chef, I think of it like the amused bouche at a high-end restaurant. What gets you in the door is the food, but the main course is snap, right? Every, you know, that, that's the main course. You know, what we, what we give out in the pantries is important and we give out the best food possible, but it's a drop in the bucket in comparison to the benefits that, that we, we know we need to advocate for. Uh, so, you know, my team, as I said, like have done this work, backbreaking work day in and day out. And, you know, we went from 1500 volunteers a year to zero by the end of March of 2020, because we had to cancel that program. Uh, and many of our volunteers were seniors. And then with New York Cares, we've had 1400 new volunteers and who've come back and sort of allowed us to reach so many, so many people across the, the city. And it's been a way a lot of people want to volunteer in walking distance to Wisca or to their homes and Wisca is close by if you live on the Upper West Side. So it's been really nice for people to be able to engage with us in a new way. And sort of even during the pandemic, you know, whether it's being outside, handing out food, whether it's sorting through vegetables, whether it's making calls, there's just lots of ways people can get involved. Uh, so, you know, this is sort of a, in a nutshell, so a bit of what we've been doing, you know, but like our job is to change the food system. Right? Our job isn't to just hand out some food because that's not the big picture. Like uh, we, we feel we're purpose built to feed and nourish our community. And what that means is not just about food. The food is our direct service and it's actually how we show how that work should happen in direct service. You should be 50% fruits and fresh fruits and vegetables. Why wouldn't you? That's what most people are trying to eat in their home diets. You should be able to get food delivered to your home. And to that example, like we raised uh, a large amount of money, uh, a couple million dollars separately outside of our budget to build out the equivalent of Instacart or Fresh Direct. We are building out a virtual pantry model where customers can order the food they want and have it delivered into their neighborhood and or homes, depending on their health status, right? And it's gonna be open source for any organization in the city to use or beyond. And, and that's what we feel like as our next innovation, right? We brought the choice model to Wisca decades ago, and now we're bringing the choice, we wanna bring the choice model in a technology format for the 21st century to all pantries who use it uh, or can use it. At the same time, you know, if you've been to SPSA, it is a beautiful building, but it is not one that's meant to have 4 million pounds of food pushed through the doors. Uh, so we'll, we'll have, in the months ahead, we've been working for the last year on uh, warehouse space, so an expansion space. So we'll have a space where we can really be safe and organized uh, and bring in more food and you know alleviate some of the burden on the space at 86th Street, which will allow us to give better service to folks on the Upper West Side uh, at 86th Street because of the burden of all these just, you know, literally upwards of 70,000 pounds of food coming through right now every week uh, through two little double doors and a passenger elevator. Uh, it's, it's not what it's meant for. Uh, but so that's what we're here for. We're here to, you know, we're here to change the system. We, we, you know, we rescue a lot of food. And I know there's an article in the Times what yesterday about food rescue and how great that is. But the truth of the matter is like, I would say we rescue food, but food rescue is not the answer, right? Because it's further up the supply chain is issue. Like, you know, what's, what's left over in your fridge or in a restaurant isn't the real waste that's in the system. I can promise you that. Even what's on a grocery shelf isn't the real waste. When you go to Hunts Point Market and I can pick up five, 10,000 pounds of fresh produce any day of the week for free. That's how much waste is in the system. And if I wanted to pick up more, I could. And th this is the problem. So we, we are very fixated on, you know, it's the idea of like, we're fixated on recycling instead of reducing plastics, right? We're, we're fixated on food rescue instead of actually rescuing people out of food insecurity. Like it's not a personal choice. This is a, at a governmental level where change can happen. It's the same with idea, you know, be very clear. Like, I don't think all charity is good. I, I throw that out there to someone to be controversial, but to say the truth of the matter is if you're not working in collaboration and you're just doing your own work as a, as a charity, you probably don't care about the change in the system. You, you care about keeping your organization afloat, right? In my past as a more national level work, I, I worked with leading the Chefs Move to School program and worked with chefs all across the country 
who were supporting schools, right, to help them better their food menus, uh, to make it more marketable and, and tastier. That, you know, chefs and restaurants don't, truthfully, and I'm a chef who had restaurants, don't naturally have any knowledge or expertise in nutrition. It's just not something that they're meant to do. Their job is to make tasty food, not necessarily healthy food. So they needed some help in that area as well, but they collaborated right with other chefs and with school districts. It's about collaboration, but it's really time to get real, right? Like eviction issues are about affordable housing. You know, people in their illnesses, it's about healthcare. Livable wages are, are important, especially for the food service industry. Like you might be complaining that you're getting bad service at restaurants right now, but you know, this is a function of years of, of pain in the industry for, for, for the staff members, especially in the back of house. Uh, so for WISCA, you know, we're just continually focused on pushing the system at a city, state and federal level. Uh, so it's sort of what I, I'll just quickly end with sort of, you know, obviously what you can do, you know, speak to others, you know, whether you use social media or whether you have friends you talk to in person or on the phone, talk about hunger, like send them that Mazon video. I mean, it's, it's only what, 11 minutes. It's really easy to watch that. I mean, it's actually not easy to watch it, but it's the simple thing to do to get to spur someone's conversation. At, at an advocacy level, like you all have city council members who are uh, present or they are new ones coming into, into play. So you should talk to them and ask what their stances are on hunger, right? Like for example, at city council, there's $22 million allocated for emergency feeding every year uh, and not a penny of that can be spent on fresh produce it's a tragedy right like there's all this money for canned goods and none of it can be for a choice of fresh produce why is that so it's something we're all working on same at the state senate and state assembly level like make sure you get to know your your assembly member and your state senator thank them for where, how they're supporting hunger and ask them to be able to do more and how you can be helpful to them and obviously federal i think you know it's 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 the hardest to do, but you know, whether it's following Mezone or following FRAC and doing their sign on letters and you know, whether it's these, those, those things are important and your voice matters. And having worked enough on Capitol Hill, they track how many calls they get, right? That's, that's important to them. And if for what direction on any bill, so your call matters and it feels really nice to take five minutes to just make a call and don't even worry about talking to the, the elected official. Their staffers are the ones who are writing all the legislation. They're the ones you want to talk to. So don't feel like you're being, you know, not getting through to the elected official. Use your time and speak to anyone who's there because uh, they, they could be the elected official someday, right? If you're healthy and able, right, go on our website and volunteer. Uh, we have 40 to 50 people volunteering every day. We do it with New York Cares. We're socially distant. Everyone's masked. Uh, we do short shifts, keep people nice and healthy. We got lots of snacks and we have a great team. Uh, and of course, as mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we of course always will take people's financial support, uh, especially we know B'nai Jeshrin and the community has been incredible supporters of WISCA throughout the year, but always at the high holidays has been just, it's, it's an amazing show of support when all the truly all the checks come to WISCA the day after uh, and we go through and we're like, we just can't believe the level of support. Uh, and so we're ever thankful. Uh, so, you know, for us, we're focused on community dignity choice, just three simple words. And, and we're going to keep doing that. It doesn't matter what happens with what variant. Uh, we haven't missed a day of distribution for the entire pandemic, and we don't plan on changing now. So we thank everyone for the support. And I look forward to discussing a bit more of like what, what else can happen in the months and years ahead in the, in the system. And I'll pause there. Thanks. Well, I, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I had no idea, obviously, of all the things that WISCO was doing, especially during the pandemic. And obviously what you're thinking ahead uh, is just incredible. Uh, um, I really want to thank you so much um, for bringing us up to date and uh, for giving us lots and lots of things to think about. Um, please put your um, questions in the chat um, and we'll, we're gonna um, move on um, to hear from Beth and Ira Wolfman. Um, and then we'll get back to questions and answer. And Greg, I hope you stay a very long time with WISCA. Thank you so, so much. I really mean it. Um, our next speaker is Beth Siegel. Um, I have to find bios. Okay, got them. Um, 
Beth is a longtime member of BJ, um, has been a volunteer of the lunch program. And after Carol Gellis retired, Beth assumed the leadership role of the program. She has also been a member of the Long Range Capital Campaign Committee, membership committee. She's made cold neutral calls and helped with a variety of fundraising events. And in her spare time, Beth is the deputy director of PATH, business and program delivery at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Um, welcome Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. And, and Greg, um, you do incredible work and I'm pleased to be a supporter of your efforts as well as my husband, Scott, who is another box here. Um, but I, I, I share with, uh, I, I, I share this honor to, to lead this program um, with Carol Gellis, who for so many years, and Carol is also, she's the woman who said that she would write a check to you, Greg, right after watching the Mazon. Um, Carol was long involved with, with the Judith Bernstein lunch program, long, clearly long before I have been, but it was Carol who inspired me to come join the efforts there. The, the program started, as I understand, um, when Marshall Meyer came to be the, the rabbi at BJ um, back in the 1980s. I don't have the exact dates, but he believed that um, we couldn't be a Jewish community without a shelter and a lunch program. And it was under him that we started those efforts. Um, it, it, it was a program that originally just um, it gave out um, bag lunches, um, and then the ceiling collapsed in, in BJ itself. And that happened in about 1992, I believe. So that's when the, the bag lunches started because we didn't have a place. Um, we were actually going to St. Paul's and St. Andrews then too. But when we came back to BJ, Carol said, we have a kitchen, we should make soup. And so began the, the real efforts of the soup kitchen. It is called the Judith Bernstein uh, Lunch Program. Um, it was named after um, a, a former member. Um, she unfortunately um, was young when she died. She was actually on the Pan Am Lockerbie flight when that flight went down. And um, so it, it was in her honor that the program was named as her family um, endowed the, the program. So what is the BJ Lunch Program? We are a bunch of volunteers. Um, Carol was a skilled professional in the culinary industry. Myself, I was, I just dabble in my own kitchen. Um, but we are a collect a collection of volunteers who are interested in giving back to the community in providing uh, a, a tasty and healthy lunch to um, people who came to BJ. Um, there were roughly 80 to 100 people who would come for lunch on Thursdays. The meal itself is prepared on Wednesday evenings and um, we do all of the prep work and, and the Thursday effort is to not have a what was traditional in some places a chow line. This was a meal served with dignity. Um, it was plated. There were tables and chairs um, with tablecloths and people sat at a table and they were served their meal. And the meal consisted, it was a hot lunch. It um, always was a, a soup with um, fresh vegetables, um, it was a salad, it was tuna fish or egg salad and uh, a hot starch um, and a dessert. And dessert could be bread pudding um, or in, in today, um, sometimes, uh, you know, apple, cooked apples, a, a variety of things that, we, that were made before the pandemic, right? Um, but again, in, in, in its formation, it's funded through grants uh, that we apply for and through food donations that we get through the um, City Harvest and um, other, I, I'm not quite familiar with all of the, the donations that we get, um, but they continued and they, um, 
they provide us with the ability to serve our uh, fresh fruits and vegetables as part of what we do. And, and that's a really important piece. Um, healthy meals is, is what we are about. Um, so we, we do that, as I said, um, through these food donations and the grants actually, Greg, that we receive, we are able to get fresh produce. So um, lucky us, it's not all about canned foods. Um, but you know that that was at a time before the pandemic, and like I said, it was 80 to 100, and people came and they sat in Frankel Hall. We had entertainment, uh, we had music and performances, and it was um, it was a lunch with dignity. It allowed people to feel um, valued, and and um, you know, for me, the I started. Um, taking over the program in, it was August of 2019. So I had a couple of months under my belt um, without Carol, but with a wonderful team of, of volunteers, many of whom had worked there for, for years um, and several who are on this call today. So thanks for joining us. It's good to see you. Um, but uh, we were, could have been anywhere from eight to 10 people in the kitchen working, uh, preparing these meals. But, um, you know, I remember the day like it was my birthday. It was March 11th um, when the city shut down and we were panicked at, at some level. It's, um, you know, how do we make sure that the people who come for our food every day, the 80 to 100 people, have something. We couldn't serve them food in Frankel Hall anymore. That wasn't going to be permitted. And even the number of people who could actually come to the synagogue to work um, and prepare the food was, was limited. Um, so uh, in, in the beginning, we were there, we were masked, we were always gloved and aproned and hair netted, but we made sure that the doors were open. We were socially distanced. I you know, arranged the food setups in, in areas so that people could feel comfortable and continue to volunteer. You know, Many of the people who used to volunteer with the program before the pandemic um, weren't able to during the pandemic, either be, because of their own health situation, um, the age limitations that we had with respect to um, who could uh, who could actually go to BJ because there were limitations with respect to who could be in BJ, um, and we went from that you know from eight to ten people down to about four or five people who would be able to come and prepare the food, and we went from preparing food that was served to creating a a a a bag lunch. We not unlike uh, uh, delis that have the you know the soup containers. We now um, create our four course meal. We cup the food. We bag it with silverware. Um, supplement with some fresh fruit, and um, and they can line up outside of BJ now and get their lunch on Thursdays. But I think one of the things that I I, I also want to just share about that is that we with our food donations we we take any type of fresh fruit or vegetable that is given to us and we've created the opportunity for people when they come to get their lunch to also take the extra um, fruits and vegetables that we have and and that has just been such an important thing um, because you know with with the food insecurity that does exist and the diversity of people who come. So we don't serve 80 to 100 anymore um, for, the, for the same limitations that Greg has experienced in, in his program. You know, we had elderly, we had um, people who were health compromised. Um, you know, they can't necessarily come, those, though they do have some uh, caregivers who do come and, and pick up lunches for, the, for them. Um, but there has been a change in the dynamic of, of people who do come, and it's less. Uh, we now only make 50 lunches, 
um, we had been making 100 and that 100 just got reduced to the sweet spot of about 50 people who come regularly on Thursday. And when I say regularly, I mean, since the pandemic, we haven't missed a, we haven't missed a Wednesday night or a Thursday giveaway. We have uh, it's 70 plus consecutive weeks of food preparation and, and, and giveaway. And um, it's, um, it's not 27,000 households, but I can tell you that about at least five to, to 6,000 lunches have been provided in this time since COVID. Um, that's the program. We actually even made it kosher for Passover. So, um, and uh, I, I, for me, it's a privilege um, and an honor to be able to do this. It's the one way that I feel that I can um, contribute and impact um, the injustice of, of food insecurity. And um, we have several volunteer opportunities. So if anybody is interested in volunteering, um, we actually have a donation from Zabar. They donate their, their breads to us and that's the bread that we use to for the sandwiches. Um, but we also give away any of the extra and, and there's an opportunity to pick that up and, and come deliver it to BJ. We cook on Wednesday nights, we prepare the food and then we give it away on Thursday. So if you're interested, um, you can reach out to me at beth.siegel, pretty easy, beth.siegel at yahoo.com or, or Kiana is on, you can reach out to BJ directly and, um, and come volunteer with the program. Beth, a yes, to you and your volunteers. It's amazing that you kept this program going all through COVID. And um, in behalf of the community, I really send a big thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. Um, Ira uh, Wolfman is a long-term member of BJ. He has served on many committees over the years. He is heavily involved with the Heber Kadisha. He was a co-facilitator in the Wise Aging Committee, and he, he is a member of the Committee on Racial Justice Task Force and involved in the BJSPSA Justice Task Force, and a true, real wise guy. And he's going to talk about um, a program that the wise guys put together during um, COVID. Um, the floor is yours, Ira. You just have to unmute. I'm unmuted. I did it before you can, you got to me. Okay, so I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I am going to tell you about a small program that I think has made a small bit of difference, but really mattered to a group of people who were already meeting. I'm going to tell you very briefly what the Wise Guys is, and then I'm going to tell you how we got involved with a restaurant in the Bronx named La Morada, which is doing some wonderful work. So the Wise Guys is a group of 11 BJ men who have been meeting every few weeks since the fall of 2018 together to explore the oys and the joys of aging. Um, we've been meeting on, on Zoom since the pandemic started last year. Our group is an outgrowth of the Wise Aging Program, which is based on a book of the same name by BJ members, Linda Thal and the late Rabbi Rachel Cowan. And this was a program that was underwritten by a family um, to train facilitators at BJ. And I've been working with Marvin Israelo and we've had this group for the last three years. So we meet every few weeks. Last summer, one of our members, David Bernard, um, told our group about the work being done by a Bronx-based restaurant called La Morada. This is a restaurant owned by a family of undocumented immigrants from the Oaxaca area of Mexico. They specialize in Oaxacan cuisine, and their primary clientele are Mexican immigrants who live in the Mott Haven neighborhood of the Bronx, including in the public housing directly across the street from the restaurant. So David explained to us that the owners of La Morada the Saavedra Mendez family had developed a program in response to the needs of their community when, when COVID got going. They first asked for contributions to help to keep the restaurant going. And then they saw that the community had enormous needs and they decided to try and meet them. The residents were low income earners, underserved by city and healthcare providers and in danger of losing their jobs. 
and many of them were essential workers. So the restaurant owners decided to develop an anti-hunger initiative they call a mutual aid kitchen. It's a soup kitchen, but it's a soup kitchen with a difference because it's really aimed at bringing people together in many different ways. So for the past four, year, four or five days a week, they provide 200 morning meals to refugees living in the Bronx and immigrants and hundreds of cooked afternoon meals through churches and other community organizations that, have, um, that are working with them. Um, they also provide packages of fresh fruit and vegetables for about 100 families a day. The families pick up the produce at the restaurant and use the veggies and fruits to prepare their meals at home. Um, SPSA, Jim Melchior of SPSA was one of the people who got involved with this. Um, through our joint SPSA, B'nai Jeshrin, um, I think Racial Justice Committee, people heard about it. Um, and Jim said that when both of our, our congregations um, heard what La Mirada was doing, we, they chose to work with them because they felt the initiative directly dealt with two key issues for both of our congregations, addressing food insecurity and, and talking to the rights of undocumented. So David then proposed to our group of 11 men that we both volunteer to help fund the efforts at La Mirada and we also actually make food deliveries. And the wise guys, we conferred together and we agreed to do that. So since last summer, we've donated almost $4,000 to the program as a group of wise guys. And we call ourselves wise guys because it comes from wise aging and we're all male. Um, and one Tuesday a month, a wise guy member with a car goes to SPSA and picks up produce, bananas, oranges, some staples and the like, and then drives it to the La Mirada restaurant, which is on Willis Avenue between 140th and 141st Street in the Bronx. It's about a 15 minute drive unless there's terrible traffic, which almost always there isn't. During these deliveries, we've met with the owners and we've learned a bit more from them and, and occasionally some of the people they serve about what they're doing. And since July of 2020, BJ and SPSA together have supplied La Mirada with more than $7,000 worth of fruit and non-perishable staples. This has been a really great volunteer opportunity. We were an existing group. We, we were, this was presented to us and we thought it was a great thing to add to just our regular communication. Um, and it's been a rewarding way to take a small step to address this hunger crisis in, in, in our country. Obviously things like the ongoing um, BJ Soup Kitchen, the Judith Bernstein program, um, WISCA are doing wonderful work. This is our small way um, of making a difference. And it's more meaningful to us because we've met the people involved. We've heard some of their stories. They're extremely grateful. Every once a month we show up with this stuff and the, the people are just really, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Um, other BJ members outside of my little group have also helped with deliveries. So if you'd like to join in any of these efforts, if you have a car and would like to help with the deliveries, you can send me an email. My name, as you'll see on my little box, is Ira Wolfman. And the email I'm currently using is my, my first and last name, Ira Wolfman, one word, at gmail.com. If you write to me I, and, let, and tell me you're interested, I, can, I will let you know how you might help. You can also learn a lot more about the restaurant's programs at www.lamorada, that's M-O-R-A-D-A, dot N-Y-C. That's www.lamorada.nyc. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Ira. And it's no small thing. It's a really wonderful thing that, that all of you have done. Um, and it shows what one group can do to help another community. And I think this is the kind of thing that reason we wanted to showcase um, uh, the wise guy guys and to tell the community because uh, I'm sure many people in the community had no idea and uh, from small comes big um, so thank you very much and thank you to all the wise guys um, so I am taking a look in the chat and I'm not seeing any uh, questions here so you know we're a small group right now um, perhaps we could just um, if you want to ask a question you can unmute and ask Greg um, uh, or Beth or Ira anything that you want to ask. We still have some time left. 
Does anybody want to unmute? Okay, I'm good. Go ahead. Who is it? Go it's ahead, Abby. Abby. Yeah. Um, I, I just would like to um, see if there is a good, I think sometimes we don't comprehend what food insecurity actually is. And is there a definition, a set of criteria that um, defines that? Because sometimes we think it's one thing that may perhaps is more extreme than the reality, um, you know, in terms of the way we define it. Like, the, you know, is, but is there, is there a kind of a working definition so that we can comprehend what food insecurity actually is? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Sylvia said it earlier, but, and this is why when I was saying uh, Wiska makes, was working on bringing access to healthy food as a way to fight food insecurity, it's very different than poverty. Uh, you know, we're just trying to make sure people have a reliable source of food, of nutritious food, right? And, and in some ways, you can look at it different ways, but that just means like people aren't going without a meal, right? Like if if you filled out, I think it's the questionnaire, most people like the food insecurity screening, and you said, I, I forget, sometimes they're like in the last month or in the last two months, have you gone without a meal, right? Not because you, you know, just felt like you didn't want to eat, but because you didn't have the ability to eat, like that means you're food insecure, like in a very simple way. If you're going without food, you're food insecure. And if you don't have reliable access to nutritious food, you're, you don't have the security of food. Uh, and that's theoretically what emergency food providing uh, is supposed to be helping with, right? We don't provide, I would just be clear, like also like a whisker or the, you know, food pantries across the city or the country are not providing 30 days of food per month for people, right? Like it's a top up, right? Theoretically, if you got all your government support and all these different pieces, you still might fall short of being food secure. And ideally like, like a whisker gives a five day supply of food and that's your top up is the way we I, I would almost look at it. Um, that's interesting. Cause I was gonna ask you about that. How much food do you uh, supply? Uh, for families or individuals? Yeah, we provide, I mean, pre, we provide, uh, most pantries give a three-day supply. Whisk has always done a, we do a five-day supply uh, based on my plate and federal guidelines of healthy food. Uh, but you have to remember that most people who are coming to Whisk, I, I would assume, don't just go to one pantry. They might go to a pantry or a soup kitchen. They, you know, they're, they're mixing and matching. It's the hardest job in New York City is being hungry, right? Like you, you are actually traveling all over to get all the things you need to make do. Um, the one day that I volunteered, um, I noticed that people came in with um, uh, slips and that they could get one thing from this area, from this thing, you know, produce or one kind of meat or whatever. Can they use that at other um, pantries as well? Well, every, every pantry is a separate pantry, right? Like, so like we're, uh, pantries aren't affiliated in that way, which in some way, some would say is a good thing, right? So that there's, you know, you, you could go Then people do, they have their whole schedule, right? Like you could go, if, you know, if you live in Harlem, you might come down to Wisco one day of the week and you might go over to, in East Harlem, you might go to near common pantry another day and you sort of fill all your different pieces of your needs. So but it's also it speaks so to a lack there. of, go ahead. Uh, no, you want to, I want you to finish a need to. No, I mean, it's just also the, the function of the lack of collaboration and the lack of data sharing across hunger, the hunger network, right? Like, okay. you know, the, the pandemic was the best example of her, you know, the city pushed out, you know, millions of meals without any discussion with anyone in the emergency feeding network in the early days. And they, they were like, we have to stand this program up, which is seemed nice at the time. But the truth of the matter is doing it in isolation and not sort of making sure you're hitting the right people uh, is, was, was, was a terrible show of, you know, a lack of collaborative effort. That's because we don't share data. Like, yeah. Sylvia, we have a couple of questions in the yeah. chat. I was going to ask them, go ahead. You do it. Yeah. Um, Rochelle asked, what are the qualifications to receive food? Do they need to be SNAP eligible, something else? I mean, for Wiska and most pantries, well, so, well, I shouldn't say all pantries. So many pantries, smaller pantries, 
are more neighborhood based and they have a sort of geographic focus, you know, you know, uh, Wiska has no geographic focus, right? Like anyone can come and get food from us at 86th Street from anywhere in the city. We have, and we've never, ever, ever run out of food. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter. We don't care about your income level, immigration status. There's, there's no sure. pre-qualifications. We want to know about all those things so that we can help you get access to benefits, but for food and, you know, everyone, you know, should be able to get that food. So we don't, we don't have any, any prerequisites. Um, okay, and uh, Ira Wise Guy asked, what is Wiska's greatest need and how do people find out about Wiska? Would volunteer help publicizing your services be of interest? I mean, Wiska's greatest need, I mean, truthfully, it's always in these sort of situations. Too. Uh, we serve more people. We've, we've added 65 partner sites this past year, and that's because we raised a lot more money. And donations of food, I'll be honest, are not, individual donations of food are, are not that helpful at all. They take more time to deal with. And the price you pay for that food is way more than the price that we would get it for. I can buy four cans of tuna fish for the one can that you purchase at. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, and so if people want to give their time, that's great. Time and money uh, are the most important things uh, for us. And I think that goes for a lot of emergency food providers. And, and I don't actually advocate solely to say people should just give money to WISCA, right? Like there's a lot of organizations out there. And by the way, food insecurity is important, but we're getting a lot of money pushed into our sector because we need it. But, you know, kids and education and, you know, cultural groups are all getting hammered with no fundraising. So like it, this is the time to double down and give across the board to all the things you, you cherish, even if they're not open right now. Uh, as opposed to, as in, in terms of, you know, promotion, you know, we, I guess that's a conversation to have. Like if you had groups who are good at promotion and had those connections, we always want to be having those conversations as we staff up our communications team. Uh, we'd be happy to have that conversation. Can, can you also answer, answer how, how do people find out about WISCA? Uh, from a customer standpoint or a donor standpoint or customers, you know, Whisk has been around 42 years, so it, it has a good word of mouth, but it's most websites and other partner agencies have information about Whisk so that they can refer people. Uh, this spring and summer, we did a lot of bus shelter ads in targeted neighborhoods, uh, Washington Heights, Inwood, uh, South Bronx in English and Spanish. We did a uh, radio and other ads as well about SNAP benefits. So we do some of that, obviously through the Robinhood network and others, we, we all share information uh, to sort of promote, set, to promote each other's work. Okay, we've got a few more coming in. This one I, I think is uh, hopefully easy. Is there an age limit to volunteer at WISCA? You know, it's changing by these things, you know, all these things we have to check the website right now because everything seems to be changing. The number keeps going down. I think we were at a, we were at a, right. We were at a 50 and up and then it was 60 and up. And then I think it was 65 and up uh, or down. I'm sorry. But at the same time, now we're having those questions of what's happening with the city related to vaccines. And uh, you know, we haven't been, per, you know, uh, so we're actually having discussions right now about who's going to be volunteering. And this is with New York cares and with the city. So uh, st I'd say stay tuned. I, I think it's 65 right now, but I, uh, I'll double check. Okay. Um, does WISCA provide food education for clients with specific diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, et cetera? Yeah, we, I mean, pre-pandemic, we did a lot of nutrition education, uh, and demos and things like that. Uh, but that like many things has dried up during the pandemic. That's the program. I, I, I led the largest nutrition education program in the United States for a number of years out of Washington. Uh, so that's sort of near and dear to my heart. And so we have, there's a lot of ways we can do that via distribution of recipes now as part of it. And also via texting uh, content to our customer base. Uh, so that's, that's where we're at right now. We'll, we'll bring more of that back. And some of the advertising we've done is having screens at different locations where you know, demos can be shown on a loop and things like that. But it's been another of the area that's been weak for the whole sector during the pandemic. Okay, and do any local food stores contribute food or money to Wisca? 
Uh, local food stores contributing food. Most, a lot of that will come through, right? City Harvest, for example, we get, this year we'll get, I think about 850,000 pounds of food from this year. And so their truck, there'll be a truck that's on the airport side that'll go to Trader Joe's and it'll go to Zabar's or Ore Washers and that'll, it will show up at our site right away. So they're not giving directly to us, but it comes through City Harvest. I mean, on a restaurant standpoint, uh, you know, uh, I'll just give my, I have to always plug Jacob, uh, you know, Jacob's Pickles and Maison Pickle and, you know, their team has consistently given money and also like at the at Turkey Challenge time in, in the fall, they usually donate upwards of, I think they gave 400 turkeys last year to, to Wiska and they're always, you know, they'll give us our spa their space if we want to have an event and they will supply all the food for free for like a cocktail, like they've, you know, it's pretty much anything we ever need. Uh, uh, and as well, uh, uh, yeah, they, they've been the biggest supporter food-wise for us. French Roast was giving us during the pandemic. Well, firstly, in the pandemic, Jacob's Pickles fed our entire team for the first four straight months every single day. Uh, wow. uh, and then uh, French Roast jumped in as well uh, to support. So. That's all the questions we have, Sylvia. I think it's back to you to okay. start to wrap us up. Okay. Okay. Um, so one thing we always like to talk about when we're doing these um, uh, sessions is advocacy. And as Greg talked uh, at the end of his uh, uh, time, he talked about the kinds of things you could do. And I had written up a few things because we always want people to walk away and know that there's more that they can do. Even if BJ doesn't have uh, uh, um, a group that uh, addresses this right now. So again, donate to Wiska, donate to Mazon, contribute to Wiska's turkey distribution during Thanksgiving, uh, contribute to a college to support and or establish a food pantry. My university where I went to school sent out an email and I had no idea that college students were food insecure. And so many colleges are now uh, sending out um, solicitations indicating that they want to establish food pantries for their students. Uh, City University, I know, has also done that. Um, you can support community gardens in low-income neighborhoods. You can vote for candidates who advocate for increases in SNAP eligibility for low-income seniors. You can use social media to post hunger facts and facilitate conversations with your fan, friends, followers, and your elected officials. You can go onto the Mazone website and sign on for the ad for their advocacy alerts. And you can also scroll through the Mazone, it's mazone.org um, website. And there are so many materials and so many things that you can um, uh, learn about and educate yourself about. So um, I'd like to thank um, all our presenters, Greg Silverman, Beth Siegel, Ira Wolf Wolfman, as well as the Occupy the Zoom committee, Ted Berger, Abby Katz, Judith Trachtenberg, Shirley Abraham, and especially BJ staff member Kiana Davis for all her guidance and support. So thank you all. Um, our next Occupy the Zoom will be on Thursday, August 19th. Uh, the title of it is Resetting the Table. And we're gonna be showing a film, Purple America, We Need to Talk. Uh, I hope you can join us again on August 19th. And thanks again for joining us this evening. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you, all our speakers. Thank you, Thank you again. Bye. Thank you.